Easter four weeks away. I love that. <laughs> that means spring is right around the corner. Although I think we have more Easter that's right around the corner. But in, in four short weeks, we'll be celebrating the most important event in the history of creation. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. The culmination of the redemptive plan of God. It's an, it's an incredible event. And I often look upon the passion of Jesus as like, as like a study in extremes. Right? It's the sinless one giving his life for sinners. The holy one taking on the tarnish of sin. Coming to the glories of heaven to die alone on a cross. The Son of God stepping on the head of the serpent. The one who died and is now alive forevermore. It's, it's, it's extremes. And my prayer during this season every year is that the, the Holy Spirit leads us into a new encounter with, with everything that happened during that week. And as we, as we mine through His Word, a new gem of truth might be unearthed for us to contemplate the wonder of the whole thing. Our eternal destiny is, is determined by it. Our faith is built upon it. Our hope is founded in it. Truly, the, the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God is made completely visible for all to see through his cross. But the biblical record of the events of that week is so familiar to us. It becomes like a story. And we often just gloss over it because we're just so familiar with it. And that can lead us to become complacent. Complacent with this incredible act of mercy. Mercy for lost sinners. The fact is that the accounts recorded for us in the four Gospels are the Word of God. They're inspired by the Holy Spirit. They're powerful, and they're alive, and they're active. The truth of His Word can never be exhausted. And so to lead us into that celebration of what Jesus graciously did for us during the, the coming weeks, we'll be listening to a few of the, the last life lessons that Jesus gave on his way to the cross. And we'll see what they mean to us around 2,000 years later. We'll also see, and I really hope we do see this, how, how these, each of these little lessons reveal a little more of the love of Christ for us. So we begin this morning in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. Beginning in verse 20. Matthew 20, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two of son, sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant at the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be the first be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Hmm. Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your word this morning, bless it to our hearts. Your word is complete, your truth is complete. We pray, Lord, that it would transform us and draw us closer to you after we spend this time at your feet. We pray <coughs> in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to ask you. How many of you here this morning, after hearing that story, had this thought? What audacity do these people have? And if you were standing there amongst the other ten, watching all that happen, you'd be thinking, how dare they ask him that? What a pair. And I'm talking about the two sons. Right? What, what nerve. Now, don't sit here this morning and get all Sunday school with me in your pew and Tell me, no, not me, Pastor, I wouldn't think that. I'm way too gracious to think that way. You're just going to remind you there's a commandment against bearing false witness. Just saying. 
Uh, of, course, listen, of course you would think that. I mean, why, why, but the question is, why would you think that? Why do they think that? Okay, what does that, oh, that sort of thinking, everything that happened in this little, this little interchange here, what does it reveal? Well, let's put the whole thing into context. This comes right after the scene when, when the rich man came to Jesus and asked him what he had to do to get into heaven. And Jesus says, well, keep the commandments. It's kind of funny that the guy asks him, well, which ones? That's kind of funny. So we get a pass on some of them. Jesus says, all right, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie. Honor your parents. Love your neighbor as yourself. The guy says, well, I do that. But it's funny. When you look at that little passage, you think Jesus kind of left something out here. Honor God. Have no other God before him. Keep the Sabbath. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Seems like he didn't mention that. But actually he does. He looks at the rich man and says, okay, well, go sell everything, give it all to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and follow me. So basically he's saying, turn away from the God of all your possessions, and put me first. Sacrifice for me, for God. And the guy walks away sad. Now Jesus uses that as a lesson about the heart and mind of the rich. And when we talk about the rich here, it's that mind of, that, that clings to their possessions. And they cling to what they have. They made idols out of their wealth. And after that little conversation, Peter looks at Jesus and goes, well, what about us? We gave up everything to follow you. Do we get anything? <laughs> Jesus tells them that they'll be richly rewarded and will sit on thrones in his kingdom. Now that, that statement, that little exchange there, will play a part in our text later on. But Jesus adds to that, many who are first will be last, and the last first. And then after that, he explains a little more. He goes into a parable about the laborers. And you're, you're familiar with this one. This is the one where certain men were hired in the morning for a day's wage. And every couple of hours, the boss goes out and hires a few more. And at the end of the day, he brings in one more crew, which basically just punched in and punched out. And then he pays them. And the guys that came in at the end of the day get the amount that the guys are hired in the morning were to get. So the guys waiting on line, on the payroll line, thinking they're going to get more. Like, hey, we worked all day. We're going to get more. But they don't. They get the same amount. And they weren't happy. <laughs> and the boss asked them, well, what's it to you? You agreed to that wage. And who are you to tell me what to do with my generosity? But then again, Jesus says, so the last will be first. And the first will be last. And then in the story, he predicts his death and resurrection for the third time. But the Gospel of Luke tells us, he adds to this third prediction, that, that Jesus kept from his disciples the understanding of what he was talking about. We know eventually that they would understand through the Holy Spirit. But at that moment, he kept that all from them. And now we come to our scene our smart this morning, our text. This is where he really teaches the, the first, last, last, first lesson. It's a lesson in grace, it's a lesson in humility, and it's a lesson in spiritual maturity. We read in Matthew that it's the mother who asked Jesus. The <coughs> in the parallel passage in Mark, we read that the sons ask the question. So somebody might look at you and say, oh, see, it's a mistake. No, it's not a mistake, it's not a, not a contradiction, it's actually very simple. All three of them asked him. They came together and asked Jesus this question. It was a little plan that they came up with. Now clearly they were thinking if we ask him now, we'll be sure to get some sort of preferential treatment. We'll get what's coming to us. We'll ask before anyone else does to make sure we get the best. We'll look like real go-getters. We'll look really ambitious. You know, in the corporate world today, that's a great trait to have. You, know, you have to seize the opportunities with all, right? I want this. I deserve this. Then go get it. That's an admirable way to be. It's good to be aggressive. It's good to be first and not last in anything. But not so with God. God turns everything upside down, doesn't he? Because he's God. He's sovereign. And his ways are above ours. He doesn't owe anybody anything. He never has and he never will. And he certainly doesn't play those kinds of games, those favoritism games. He doesn't do that. But as I was looking at this, I thought the response from Jesus was actually very gracious. 
He says, do you have any idea what you're asking? Can, can you drink the cup I'm about to drink? Now that term <clears throat> is referring to his passion. Like the mock trial he would go through, the beating, the crucifixion, the bitter cup of agony. <clears throat> but they have, they have no idea what he's talking about. But they say, yeah, <clears throat> we can do that. Yes, boss, I can do that. I'll put in the extra hours. I'll do all the extra work. I'll do whatever it takes. Jesus says, well, actually, yeah, you will. <laughs> you will. But it's not for me to say who sits where. That's up to the Father. It's the sovereignty of God. He graciously says, it's not my call. It's not my call. Even though Jesus is one with God, he submits to the will of the Father. That's lesson number one. He submits to the will of the Father. Even Jesus sets his will aside and follows the will of God. And the message for, for these two sons is this. God has already prepared who will sit where. He already has that figured out. So again, like, how gracious is all of that? He doesn't pull them out of the water. You know, call them out for what they're doing. He predicts what's going to happen to them. But he doesn't berate them. He doesn't ridicule them. Because in his grace, he shows mercy. He shows mercy. They don't understand. Their eyes haven't been fully opened yet. They haven't seen the risen Christ yet. But now comes the lesson in humility. The ten, the ten aren't happy. Maybe because they felt the two sons beat them to the punch by making this request before they did. Maybe they felt that Jesus might show the two sons some sort of favoritism because, well, they were schmoozing them. <laughs> by the way, schmoozing is a sentimental term. I looked it up. Maybe they believed it was so incredibly disrespectful and they were beside themselves. Either way, whatever it might be, the heart, the heart, now of all of them, that includes the two sons, it includes the mother, was the same. They wanted something in return for giving up everything to follow him. They felt something was owed to them. The two actually had the nerve to ask for it. And the ten were probably thinking about it. Now, admit it, there's a good chance you would, you would do that too. <coughs> you'd expect to be rewarded for your sacrifice, and you'd expect some sort of blessing. You'd expect some sort of preferential treatment. And if you ask first, you make sure you get it, right? That's human nature. What's in it for me? That's how our fallen hearts work. So Jesus gathers them all together, and he uses this as a divine teaching moment. And the cool thing is, with the Bible, we have the opportunity to sit in and hear the lesson. So he talks about the way things work with unbelievers. He talks about Gentiles, how rulers lord over their people. And that phrase, the lording it over someone, meaning means that they, they act as if they are superior, or they're better than them. And they see those under them as inferior. And the officials exercise authority. In this case, meaning they, they simply just boss people around. They push people around. They abuse their authority for their own benefit, for their own gain, and to feed their own egos. His illustration is to show these working class men how people can be treated unjustly when others are in it for the wrong reason. They got there by scratching and clawing their way to the top. Now, we know it all too well. We've seen it with our own eyes and our own lives, right? We've seen people do whatever it takes to get into a position of authority and power. And then we've seen them use it. It's all about being on top. But Jesus says, not so with you. Not so for the follower of Christ. This is not how you are to be. So the lesson here is a great humility. To so set yourself aside and serve others. It's to consider others' needs more important than your own. It's to treat others just as you want to be treated. But you know what? Unbelievers in the world today would completely agree with that. They would completely agree. I mean, I lost count how many times when I was working in the corporate world, I heard the phrase, do unto others. And that, it, that's true. And it's all good. But here's the question of the day for the church. If the world sees this as a good quality for everyone to strive for, how is it then the unique distinctive of the church? What's the difference? I mean, why does someone need the gospel and salvation and church and Jesus and all the stuff we preach when all they need to do is just be a decent human being and treat others as you want to be treated? 
The answer is in the last verse. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the model. That's the model. The humility of Christ is the model. We heard it in Philippians 2 a few minutes ago. Jesus didn't need to seek equality with God. He didn't need to earn it or work for it or bargain for it because he already had it. He was in glory, the complete and full presence of God, and he made himself nothing. He became a servant to give his life as a ransom. He would pay the judgment due upon those who have sinned against God. And by the way, that's everybody. But he expected nothing. Nothing. So why? <laughs> why would Jesus do that? Well, because of his great love for us. But because of his great love for us, the only way it would be possible to reconcile mankind to God would be for Jesus to do what he did. It was the only way. It was God's will that he do that. And it all brought glory to God in the end. Jesus, the first in all aspects of the word, becomes the last in all aspects of the word. But that's the example. It's more than how the world interprets the notion of do unto others. It needs to become a servant of others. It needs to become a slave to others. <clears throat> a slave or servant that expects nothing. Expects nothing. That's the distinctive for the church. It brings honor to God in all that we do. We can reflect his love to the world in all that we do. And we seek God's will and we obey it. Now, does this mean that a real Christ follower should, should live in homeless poverty in order to be an authentic believer? No, that, that's not what he's saying here at all. So the point here is this. As we look at the actions of the two sons and the mother and the ten and ourselves, we see that the human mind has a way of ranking things, good to bad, first to last. Two sons wanted to move to the front of the line, so to speak. Ten were infuriated because it wasn't fair for them to even ask it. And also the ten were infuriated because they might have been overlooked by Jesus. The two wanted to be ranked higher than the rest. They wanted to be right next to Jesus. The ten were questioning, who are you to think that? What qualifications do you have that we don't? That's the way the unbelieving Gentiles acted. You've all heard phrases like this. I've been here longer. I got here first. I have seniority over you. And seniority has its benefits. I have a higher level job. Rank has its privileges. We've heard all these things. And Jesus says, that's not you because you follow me. You follow me. For the disciple of Jesus, it's not a matter of who is better than who, or who is above who, or who is below who, or who came first, or who did something longer. There's no seniority in Christianity. There's no ranking in Christianity. There's a real simple reason for that. It's because Jesus has the highest seniority. Because he's from eternity past. In the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. You can't get much more senior than that. Jesus has the highest rank because he is one with God. All the fullness of God was placed to dwell in him. You can't get much higher than that. He has all the seniority and all the rank. And he gave it all up to come down and live as a homeless man in poverty. To live a sinless life. To give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, legs to the lame, and to raise the dead. To become Sin, Not nearly have added to his account. He became sin. And he went to the cross. And he suffered the wrath of God that he didn't deserve. For you. For me. And there's those extremes again, right? But he did that all to make it possible for those who call upon his name to have the assurance of eternal paradise. The grace of Jesus and the mercy of God. It's appropriate that Jesus taught this lesson when he did. And I'm sure he'll be glad that I think that. <laughs> Jesus taught this lesson knowing that in a, in a little more than a week, he would be crucified. He'd be crucified between two thieves. 
Two criminals convicted of their crimes, rightly convicted of their crimes. And one of those criminals, while on his cross, acknowledged who Jesus is. Now, did this man study scripture? Did he attend small groups every week? Did he go on a missions trip? No. But he saw Jesus for who he is, the King of Kings. And he said, remember me when you enter your kingdom. He humbly asked him, just remember me. And then comes the grace. You will be with me in paradise today. Amen. The man's sin is forgiven, and he was redeemed. The man was a believer for a few hours, and he received the same assurance of glory that you and I received the moment we first believed, no matter how long ago it was. The man was a believer for a few hours, and he received the same assurance that John the Apostle, who was standing right there and heard this conversation, John received the same assurances. And John lived many, many years after that. So was it fair that this man didn't have to give up anything like the disciples did? He didn't have to give up anything in order to get the same assurance. Some might think it wasn't fair. Some might think a deathbed conversion of a criminal was unfair. It's how God works. This is how he works. He doesn't work like we do. It's for him to show mercy upon whom he'll show it. This is grace. This is God's grace. And the response to grace is humility. It's humility. It's Christ-like humility. So how then do we change this thinking in our hearts? How do we lose this sense of, you know, I did this, so I deserve that? Well, for that, we go back to Peter's question. He said, we gave up everything to follow him. What's there for us? What's in it for us? Even the laborers in the parable, it has to be more for us, right? I want to go back to that passage in, uh, in Matthew and Peter. It's just before where we were. In Matthew, you want to follow along, Matthew 19. Just a couple of verses before this passage. Matthew 19. So this is after Peter says, no, we've left everything to follow you. What's in it for us? And here's Jesus' response. He says, truly I tell you, in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. <coughs> many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. The key for us is that these promises, are for when Jesus returns. Peter and the rest were thinking, like many, well, all the Jews were thinking then that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem to set up his kingdom here on earth. Remember, remember the, the, the disciples did not understand the predictions that Jesus was giving them about him going to, to the cross. They thought that Jesus was speaking of a conquest over Rome and a new kingdom where he would rule think about that, it makes a lot more sense why the two sons asked the question they did. Mm. They were thinking it was an earthly kingdom that was being set up. Mm. But it also explains why the rest didn't really get it. They were thinking the same way. And today, we need to live knowing that the rewards for the Christian are laid up in heaven. They're not here. They're in heaven. In the place where Jesus himself was preparing for each of us. Our minds should be focused on things above. We should be seeking the kingdom of God first. We should know that the dead will be raised incorruptible. The dead in him will be raised incorruptible. It really is a matter of understanding where we belong. Because in the grand scheme, in light of eternity, our lives here, it's a mist. That's it. But glory is glory. Heaven is heaven. Eternal paradise is eternal paradise. The believer in Jesus Christ is a redeemed child of God and a citizen of the kingdom of God. In this world, we're just sojourners, we're pilgrims, we're aliens. So trying to gain any favor or preferential treatment here actually makes no sense for a Christian. If anything, the Christian, and by implication the church, would look more like the world if we thought that way if we acted that way, especially within the church. If we're honest with ourselves, though, we all have those thoughts. 
what's in it for me? It might not come across that way. It might not sound like we're saying what's in it for me. It might come across as, I don't have to do that anymore. Or maybe we think like the Pharisee that prayed, thank you God that I'm not like this lowly tax collector over here. Implying, thank you God for making me better than this tax collector, and therefore I rank higher in your sight. When you hear that, that voice in your head, just stop and remember this. Anything you might think you deserve, actually none of us deserve anything to think about it, but, but anything we think we might deserve, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. It's worthless. Because, when we go back to this passage, as he told Peter, Jesus already gave it to you. You already have it. What he gave to you is infinitely superior to anything you can possibly think of. I mean, talk about ranking things, right? You already have eternal riches waiting for you. You already have a perfect place in heaven waiting for you. And yes, when he returns on his glorious day, and let's remember it, it's his day. It's not ours, it's his. But you will be in him and you'll be a part of it. This, this is all far beyond anything this world could possibly promise us. So it's kind of like this. The last thing you want is anything from this world. But the first thing you want is whatever Jesus has waiting for you. So, so let us refrain from thinking of ourselves and what we think we deserve. Let us refrain from the idea of rank and position in the kingdom of God because through the cross, we're all equal. We all need his shed blood to cover our sin. We've all been bought by that same blood. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ, and he does not play favorites. Instead, we should be rejoicing knowing that we are in his kingdom already. And we can look forward to the heavenly paradise that awaits us. And we can trust in our Abba Father. We can trust in him completely because he knows us better than we know ourselves. And we can trust him knowing when we enter into glory, he will place us and put us where he wants us according to his will. And we will rejoice over it because it will be absolutely perfect. So as we enter into this season where we contemplate his passion, his sacrifice, his suffering for us, let us really contemplate his example of complete humility and loving grace. And to do that, let us each ask the Holy Spirit to transform our minds constantly transform our minds. And I think to help us do that, I'm going to close with this, just we're going to follow, follow the words of Paul. Paul wrote this to the Colossians, and I think this is, this is really sound counsel for us. He said, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Right. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. In Christ, who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we have so much to learn, don't we? <laughs> we, we? We really do. Our minds really need to be continually transformed. We have that, that, that spoiled child mentality many times. What about me? What about me? Yet, you have promised us things we can't begin to imagine, contemplate, anything. It's far beyond. Ugh. And so, Lord, let us just set ourselves aside. Let us set up that whole idea of what's in it for me and just put that away, put that out of our, our minds. Cause our heart's desire to serve you. Serve you first. And by doing that, we serve others. And we serve others, we reflect your love and your grace. And our actions preach your gospel. So again, Lord, everything we do is for your glory. It's for you. So we pray you continue to transform us. Keep changing us. We pray the Holy Spirit will continue his, his work of molding us. Sanctifying us. Making us more Christ-like. And we confess the times when we, we push back on that. And we don't even think about it. We think about ourselves first. So we confess that, Lord. We confess the times we do that. We leave that at the cross. 
We receive your forgiveness for it. We pray that your spirit will fill us with your love and your grace and your, your humility. All for you, Lord. Amen.